Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Did everybody get a chance to get a, there we go. Everybody get a chance to get a bulletin this morning as I came in? Very good. Just a few things to make you aware of. Uh, you can find these also in your bulletin if you want to click on them later. But um, our women's Bible study, which is Tuesdays at 7 p.m., is now meeting at the home of Stacy Martinez, West Haven, kind of out on the west side of uh, Franklin, aptly named West Haven. Um, but uh, it meets every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, Stacy's right in the back there. She's got her hand up. Uh, so any ladies, newcomers to the church, you want to be a part of that, uh, you can see her for directions. You can also talk to Julie Chochin, who's our senior pastor's wife, about uh, the book that they're going through during that time. If you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, one other thing, and again, this is in your bulletin, but uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, Operation uh, Christmas Child, which is... Bulletin uh, handout is right here, and uh, what it basically entails is we pack boxes with toys and gifts, and these get sent to kids around the world who are in need. It gives them a chance to have a, a good Christmas where they may not have before. Uh, so it's actually going to be in two weeks. Um, if you'd like to take part in this, uh, we'd like you to bring shoe boxes to church next, or actually two two Sundays from now, November seventeenth. Um, there is a $7 fee that goes along with it that's just for shipping, just for making sure it gets to where it needs to go. So, again, anybody who would like to uh, take part in that, uh, just be looking out for that. There's actually some boxes in the back there on that back table in the back corner of the room for anyone who'd like to go ahead and get a box and be prepared at that time. So just to take part in that. So, again, in two weeks is when we will collect those and send them out. All right, before we worship this morning, if you would, uh, open your Bibles with me to the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. It's the second to the last book in the Old Testament. Does anybody need a Bible this morning? Everybody's covered? Okay, great. Zechariah, chapter 3. If you follow along with me, I'm going to read verses 8 through 9. This is the angel of the Lord speaking to Zechariah. He says, Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of sin of that land in one day. Of course, this is a prophecy about the coming Messiah, which would happen four or five hundred years after this was written. When the Lord said, when the angel of the Lord says that he will remove the sins of the land in one day, he's talking about the crucifixion. Well, we understand today that this entails more than what was understood then as the Jewish Day of Atonement. It would come to be universal. Day of Atonement for Jew and Gentile, slave and free. Every trespass of every one, for all time, atoned for in one day. All that he requires of us is repentance and faith. God is so good. It's a little wonder that in Psalm 95, the psalmist declares in the first two verses, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him in thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. Would you stand with me right now as we pray before we uh, go to worship? Let's prepare our hearts for the God who is the God of our salvation. Let me know and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be in your presence this morning. God, we just lift you up for all the great things that you do. Lord, for your mercy, for your love, for your creation, just the way that you work in our lives. We thank you that you are the God of our salvation, Lord. That we can cry out to you, depend upon you, for eternal life. Father, we just invite you in our presence this morning. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Lord, we want this time of worship to be about you and who you are and what you have done. Lord, just be with us now as we lift you up in praise and glory. Thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's such an honor and a privilege to 
worship with y'all this morning. And our prayer this morning is that the Holy Spirit would just come into this room and just open our eyes. Open the eyes of our minds and our hearts and prepare us for the things that the Spirit has to teach us and show us today. So let's just sing. Let's open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Lord, we just seek your presence and Holy Spirit to fill us this beautiful morning that you blessed us with. We're so grateful to gather in your name to worship you. Just to recognize your greatness and your holiness and your beauty and your wonder. Lord, the majesty of your creation is all around us. This time of year we're reminded of just how beautiful, how glorious and magnificent you are. Your signature is all around us. Your beauty is everywhere we look. Lord, be with us this time. As we just sing and lift our praise and worship to you, Lord, you are worthy of all of it. In Jesus' name, we worship you. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Lord, you're so beautiful, Lord, and we praise you and worship you this morning. Lord, open our minds, prepare our hearts for the message you have for us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name.
You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made But it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless world No one could express how much you deserve Lord, we gather in your name because we love you. Because we honor and worship in you and we give you the glory. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for redeeming us. You are so wonderful. Go before us this day. Fill this room with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Lord, put on our hearts the things that you would have us meditate and contemplate on. 
deliver the message into our hearts that you have for each one of us this day. That's a privilege to gather in your name. And we just ask that you be with us in the magnificent and glorious and all-sufficient name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Say hello to your neighbor. Tell him good morning. It's an awesome thing to sing about Jesus, you know. It's a strange thing to think that, um, you know, uh, in some churches you're almost afraid to say that name because, you know, it might offend somebody. You don't want to speak too much about Jesus, but there's something just beautiful about singing about him and, and letting him be at the forefront of who we are. Some of you might remember this old song years ago. If you do, why don't you sing it with me? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, maker, Jesus, like blackness, <laughs> the rain. Jesus, 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 let him help. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. And Lord, we do bless you and praise you this morning. And Father, we pray that uh, in this place today, even as Jason was praying earlier to you, we just ask that the Holy Spirit would be present and, uh, present and help us to see Jesus as we come before you today. We pray that, Lord, we would hear the things that your word would say to us, that we would understand them, that we would apply them, that we'd allow you to be glorified in our lives as we live these things out. We know that you desire to speak to your church this morning, so we pray that, God, you would do that very thing as we open your word here this morning. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, uh, I think uh, we asked earlier, but just in case, again, does anyone need a Bible? We'd love to put one in your hands as we read through these passages. Uh, just raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Everyone came in here without a Bible one time or another. So, all right. We're all good. Well, I'd love to see you guys showing up with your, uh, some of you have swords, some of you have switchblades, some of you have iPods and iPads and stuff like that. So, it's good. It's very good. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, open up our Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're making our way through the New Testament. I know a number of you are new to this this morning, so we're making our way through the New Testament. Uh, as we, uh, as we uh, try to make our way through all of God's Word, when we get to the end of Revelation, guess where we're going to start? Genesis. Genesis. We're going to start right at the beginning there, too. So, But uh, this morning, we find ourselves in Paul's first letter to Timothy. Again, these three letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus, are what we call the pastoral epistles. They're letters that Paul writes to two particular pastors. Uh, Timothy, we know as a young man, a relatively young man. Titus, we don't know as much about. But T uh, Timothy, as a younger guy... As a matter of fact, uh, young enough that he feels a little bit intimidated 
in his ministry. And Paul tells him not to let anyone despise you or look down upon you because of your youth, uh, because in fact you are called and you are to be faithful to that calling with which you are called. And so Paul is writing this letter to instruct and encourage uh, to help uh, this young pastor, this protege of his really, who had been with him on a number of missionary uh, outings and had spent time with him, uh, to learn to take on this role that God has called him to. And so with that in mind, uh, we're going to be looking today at leadership in God's church. Okay, now the church is not the building that we meet in. It's not the facility that we rent or that we own or whatever the case might be. The church, the Greek word ekklesia, is literally the called out ones of the body. Uh, Chuck Smith used to, uh, probably told you this before, but Chuck Smith used to uh, tell a story about how someone came up to him one time on a Sunday morning and said, hey, you know, there's people smoking in the back of the sanctuary. And Chuck kind of lightly corrected him and said, well, I think what you actually mean to say is that the sanctuaries are smoking. You know what I'm saying? The church is not the building. It's not the facility. Uh, as a matter of fact, just to tie that story together, there was a time in which, uh, 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 during the early 70s, when, you know, if you're familiar with the Calvary Chapel movement, and some of you are, and some of you were there. Mike, I think, was kind of back in those days, and I think he had longer hair back then. Uh, and I don't know if he's one of the guys showing up barefoot in church or not, but there was a bunch of hippies showing up in the back with bare feet and everything. And I hear they used to stick their toes in the communion little holder things and the seats in front of them and all that. Well, people began to kind of tell me they need to put shoes on and everything before they come in the church because they had just got new carpeting in there. And Chuck had said, well, look, I think what we need to do then is tear up the carpeting because if that becomes a reason for people to stay out of the building, then we've got it wrong. You see, you are the church. We are the church. The body of Christ is the church. It's a called out assembly of believers. It's the body of Christ universal, whatever name or stripe you fall under. If you're a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, saved-by-His-grace Christian, then you're part of the body of Christ. Okay, that sounds awfully simplistic, but it really isn't more complicated than that at a fundamental level. If, you have, if you've been born again by the finished work of Christ on the cross, then you are a Christian. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. You may not be walking in the Spirit, and maybe that's something we should talk about, but if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed until the day of redemption, because Jesus has paid for you and your sins, you are part of the body of Christ. That is what the church is. It is a called out assembly. Uh, and that, by the way, makes us distinct from the world around us. Again, if we're not walking in the Spirit, it might be harder to see the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. But at a fundamental level, again, if a Christian is walking with the Lord and part of the body of Christ, it becomes obvious that there's a distinction between a Christian and a non-Christian. A part of the church or someone who is not in the church. Either you're a saint or you ain't, as the expression goes. Now, this is important both practically and spiritually. Spiritually because, again, we've been redeemed by Jesus. We belong to him. Paul would say in Galatians, and we've spoken about this, we went through his letter, but he said, I have been uh, bought at a price, therefore the life I live, I'm no longer my own, the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for my sins, who died for me, okay? Spiritually speaking, we have been changed. We've been brought out of one place and put into another. We're no longer in the world, we are in the church. God help us if we're walking on the fence, because eventually you're going to slip and you're going to catch it in the end. So be careful you don't walk on the fence. Both be firmly planted in the kingdom of God. Now, practically speaking, we are called along those lines and empowered to live lives that are different from the world around us. God gives us the ability by the presence of his Holy Spirit in our lives to make us different than the world around us. There's no reason that a Christian should be undercover. Okay? Some of us are doing our best to hide our identity so that no one knows that we're walking with Jesus. We want to fit in. And some of us justify that by thinking, well, if I'm relevant to the world outside, then I'll, have, I'll find some way to lead them to Jesus. The problem with that thinking is that we often try so hard to be so relevant to the world that we become irrelevant to the purposes of God. Okay, there's no such, there ought to be no such thing. Unfortunately, there are. There ought to be no such thing as an undercover Christian. As we come together as the body of Christ, we, we grow together, we learn together, we encourage one another. In the book of Hebrews, as a matter of fact, it talks about stirring up one another to love and good works. And the word stir up there means to incite, like you would incite a riot, okay? When we're here gathered together, one of the purposes of that meeting is that we might encourage each other and push each other on to run the race with endurance with the intention of winning. To run, to set aside those things that would keep us from running. That's part of what the church is about. That's what God does within the body of Christ as we gather together. 
Uh, we said it before, and we certainly love when people come to church that don't know the Lord because it gives us a chance to share the love of Christ, to teach them about the truth, that they might come into that relationship. But that's actually not the primary reason for the gathering of the saints. The gathering of the saints is for the purpose of training us that we might go out and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey what Jesus said and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's, it, this is a place where evangelism does happen, but it's not the primary purpose for the gathering of the saints. It's that we might become equipped, that we might walk with the Lord with intention and purpose and with fruit being born in our lives. These ideas are summed up in Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians where uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have uh, had from God, and it's, you're not your own. You, again, were bought at a price. Therefore, you're going to glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. That's the purpose of our walking in the world. And that's the purpose of our coming together, that we might draw each other to such a place where that becomes sort of the motto of our lives. Okay, We belong to the Lord. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and God desires to use those bodies here in time and space to reach a lost world that needs to know Jesus. This is an admonition to all who would seek to follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 5, he speaks about this fundamental difference in the life of a Christian not point by point by point by saying, okay, guys, here's what it looks like, but he does explain what the life of a believer does look like in, in various contexts. And he says this, Paul gives instruction on Christian living when lived out in Ephesians 5. I won't, I won't turn there. We're going to turn to other passages today. But Paul gives instruction as far as Christian living so that when we live it out, we demonstrate a differentness about ourselves. We're not the same as those who are unredeemed. And therefore, our lives will reflect these things as we seek to live out a spirit-filled life, because that's the kind of life a non-believer cannot live. Now, in order to help his followers and to establish and perpetuate the church, his bride, and to help her in her continued health and growth, Jesus gave the church specific gifts. And here I will ask you to turn. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Just turn left. Just a handful of books, and you're going to come across Ephesians. By the way, I, it's, it's, it's almost as irritating to me as it's a small world when I'm at Disneyland. But there's an adage that will help you understand where certain epistles are. God eats popcorn too. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then the T's, Thessalonians, Timothy, and such. Uh, I hate that. It drives me crazy. But, uh, but it does help. It does help. So Ephesians chapter 4. Where Paul is writing here, we're going to look at actually in specific at verses 11 through 16. Where Paul writes about these gifts that Jesus has given his church. And he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, that, uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, namely Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This is the purpose for the gifts, and this is what happens when the church gathers together, okay? Now, some have seen uh, in this list of gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Some have seen in this, uh, this idea of pastors and teachers being actually one person being spoken about with two different uh, functions, pastor and teacher. Uh, whether or not you subscribe to that, I, I tend to think that that is kind of what's in view here, but, uh, you know, not all... Uh, Teachers are necessarily pastors, but all pastors by definition are teachers, okay? So it's possible that he may have in view just one particular ministry in mentioning these two. But the reason I say that is because some of us are familiar with the term the five-fold ministry. How many of you have heard that term before? Really? Nobody. I'm surprised. Oh, a couple of you have. Um, the five-fold ministry, this is where that comes from. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Uh, it may, in fact, be a four-fold ministry, but whatever the case, the point is that these ministries, and hence ministers, are considered by Jesus to be a gift to the church for the purpose of building it up in love. The apostles speaks of the actual apostles, those who follow Jesus. Okay, Not just apostles in the general sense of one sense, but in specific, the guys that Jesus handpicked 
And then, of course, after Judas, there's debate about who number 12 turned out to be, whether it was Matthias or Paul. People debate about that. But in any case, the original apostles are what in view, or what are in view when he says apostles. Prophets. Now, there are prophets in two senses. There are those that foretold. In other words, they were given specific prophecy about the future, things and events to come that had not happened yet. The New Testament, as a matter of fact, the Bible itself is filled with this. But then there's also the idea of forthtelling, preaching the word of God as, 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 as guided by the Holy Spirit in, in a moment. Uh, now, there are, uh, there are the apostles that fit both of these molds of apostles and prophets. You look at Matthew or John uh, or Peter who wrote books and foretold the word of God, but also included in what they wrote was often foretelling. There's prophecy involved in things that they wrote. Paul would fall into this category as well as an apostle born out of due time, or born in due time. So there are two ministries in that regard. Someone like Agabus in the book of Acts, uh, both forth, uh, foretold Paul's end and all this kind of thing. He also foretold a famine was coming. That's prophecy. Uh, Phil, uh, Philip is an evangelist, we're told, in the book of Acts, and his four daughters, his four virgin daughters, were prophets or prophetesses. And so this is a ministry of foretelling, and, 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 uh, and in some cases, foretelling as well. There are two sides to that ministry. Now, evangelists, that's very simple and straightforward. Those who bring the gospel out to the world. Those who preach the good news with the intention of seeing people come to Christ. And then, of course, again, there are pastors and teachers, or pastor teachers, depending on whether or not uh, Paul intended to split those into two roles or not. But these are those who are called to teach the word of God and to shepherd the flock of God. Now again, some would separate these two roles. Maybe they're together. In any case, we don't, we're not absolutely sure what is intended there. Again, I think it's actually speaking of one role in two functions. Uh, but whatever the case, the important thing to recognize here uh, in the midst of all of this is that all of these roles have, at a heart level, the same job description. Right? What is that job description? It is to, uh, again, to edify or to build up the church in love. They share a same job description, the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, are all of these ministries around today? Some of you are on the edge of your seats. Are these ministries all around today? Well, two or potentially three, yes. One, no, and one in a sense, but not another. Good enough? Okay. No. As far as apostles, there are no apostles today. Okay? There are those denominations that practice what's called apostolic succession. Uh, I came out of the Catholic Church, where that's, that's, that view is held, where Peter uh, is succeeded ultimately by the Pope today, and the bishops around him are, are representatives of those who have uh, followed in the, in the path of the original uh, disciples. That is not true. That is not a biblical idea. Uh, I don't hesitate to say that plainly. The Bible never teaches anything like apostolic succession. You can look cover to cover, and you will never see God commanding that the disciples were intended to pass on their ministry and to others who would follow afterwards. Because in doing so, that would mean that these, uh, these apostles that would follow would, like them, have the ability to share new revelation from God and all of these things that might follow logically. There are no apostles today in the original sense of the word. Yes, there's a general sense in which we are all sent ones. We're all apostles in that extremely general sense. But in view of here, again, is the original apostles, and there are none who have taken their place. Are there prophets? Well, I do believe that God does speak today, even as he did in the first century, among people, again, maybe Philip's daughters, uh, maybe those who spoke like Agabus or something like that. I don't think that ministry has come off the scene. However, there are no prophets today who speak on the level of giving the word of God as those in Scripture did. There is no new revelation on par with Scripture. As a matter of fact, anything that purports to be prophecy today needs to be judged in the grid of God's Word. Amen? Amen. Okay, I don't make sure you're not just nod your head in agreement with me. Think that through for a minute. If I were today to say, Thus saith the Lord, the world is going to end next Tuesday. Okay? If I were to make that statement, okay, you would have every responsibility to sit around watching next Tuesday and see if the world came to an end or not. And when it didn't, what would that tell you about my prophetic ministry? You should be stoned. I should be stoned. <laughs> now, and I'm glad you said that, because most people today, and good, I'm going to do that, by the way, if I ever do something so stupid as that. But 
there are those today that want to be prophetic in their ministry. They want to claim a prophetic ministry from God, but they don't want to stand in the scrutiny of what God has to say about false prophets. They want to simply say, thus saith the Lord, and then they'll give some extremely generic, general kind of prophecy that, they, you know, well, it could be right if it means this or that or whatever kind of thing. That's not the way that people spoke in Scripture. Okay, when prophecy comes in Scripture, Peter says it does not come by any private interpretation of man, but holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God never makes a mistake in prophecy because he is outside of time altogether. When he tells the end, he knows the end from the beginning, and he gives us information along the way that gives us insight or a glimpse into what he has planned, it will always come to pass, even in the most minute detail. That's why we stand in confidence in the Word of God. It's one of the primary reasons that we know that the Word of God is from outside of our time and space. It is from another source outside of time altogether. It is alien in nature, if you will, but not the way Eric von Donnegan might have you believe. It's outside of human realization, interpretation. It is from God, okay? And prophecy in that level, in terms of giving new revelation that is on par with Scripture, Absolutely not true. Absolutely not in existence today. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the Mormons come purporting to have what? Another testament of Jesus Christ. How can you, now there are myriad ways to disprove the validity of that claim. But at a, right off the at, off the bat, if you are claiming a new revelation from God, you are automatically subjecting yourself to the scrutiny of the Scriptures as to whether or not these things are so. And if they are not so, they are to be they are to be put out of hand entirely. They are given no time, no weight, no anything. Okay? That kind of prophetic ministry is not on the scene today, although I do believe God does still speak to his people directly. Uh, we see this in the New Testament, and we see no reason to think that that may have ended. Um, evangelists. Certainly evangelists are around today. There's no secret about that. Anytime God calls someone to share the word of God and the truth of God with the intention of bringing someone to Christ, evangelism is taking place. And pastors and teachers. Certainly, of course, this is... Uh, this is a ministry that is, is certainly alive and well today. God is using teachers to help us understand the scriptures. Uh, there are pastors that are called to shepherd the flock of God and to take care and to, to care for those sheep that God has put under their care, or obviously in my own case, in our care. And so this is a responsibility, not just an existing ministry, but even a responsibility. Now, there's more that could be said on this, and, and uh, I've probably mentioned before, but if you do check out the podcasts, you can download the notes from these sermons on the podcast as well. So there's additional scripture that can be brought to bear on this, but for the sake of time, I'll simply direct you that way. Now, again, whether there are four or five ministries in play, the point again is that God has an intention of giving these gifts to the church that we as saints might be equipped for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this morning, Paul takes us as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you'll also find similar, uh, strong similarities in Titus chapter 1, uh, which we'll talk about when we get there as well. But in these passages, Paul is sharing about the role and qualifications of pastors as well as those who come alongside to help. So that's where we're going to spend our time this morning is looking at this passage with that in mind. So with that said, let's begin in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now Paul writes, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And then he goes on to speak about the qualifications for a bishop. Now, when we come to this passage, there are those that, that see that word bishop and think of some very high and lofty kind of position because maybe our denominational backgrounds have led us to think of these terms in those ways. There are three terms that are used interchangeably in Scripture. One word shows up basically one time. The other two show up a number of times, again, in 1 Timothy and in Titus and also in 2 Timothy. Uh, and that is the, the, the words bishop, overseer, and pastor. Okay, pastors appears in the passage in Ephesians that we read. Bishops and elders, uh, these terms are, are seen in uh, both 1 Timothy, Titus, we'll see in 2 Timothy a little bit as well. But these three words are used interchangeably, bishop, overseer, or elder, and pastor. Uh, bishop, the word episkopos there in the Greek, simply means an officer charged with overseeing a church. Okay, uh, Presbyteros, this idea of the presbytery, uh, speaks literally, the word literally means older man or someone of mature age, okay? It is generally connected with the idea of multiple elders, which is where the Presbyterian Church uh, gets a lot of its, its, uh, its church government background, uh, but it generally it simply means an older man, one who's advanced in age or who spe speaks of maturity, uh, these words as being the same thing. So don't be thrown by the fact that these different terms are used 
They speak of the same person with different functions. Okay, it speaks of different areas of ministry in that, uh, in that arena. So again, they're interchangeable kinds of words, but they denote really only particular characteristics or responsibilities within that role. Now, what are the qualifications of such a one? Well, in verse 2, Paul begins to enumerate what, what amounts to 16 different qualifications for an elder or bishop or pastor. And I'm just going to use the word pastor uh, in our service this morning. Uh, uh, even though the word may be different in the Greek, again, we're speaking of the same person in different roles, but here are the qualifications for this person. Verse 2 starts by saying, A bishop that must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent nor greedy for money, but gentle, not quite, continues in leadership in God's church. But first off, notice this. He says here in verse 1, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Okay? Now, let's make sure we understand at the outset. Nowhere in this statement is Paul implying that one ought to be ambitious to climb the ladder to the role of pastor. That's wrong on a number of levels. First off, anyone who is a pastor knows you're not climbing any kind of rungs to take on the role of pastor. As a matter of fact, if you're going to be a pastor, and this, this by the way, is the mode of what, how God views success in ministry in the body of Christ. We're all used to these flow charts. Here's the top guy, and then here's all the other folks that work under him. And eventually, they, if, they're, if they work hard or they make sure they're noticed and they do the right things, they climb up the corporate ladder till they get to the top place. And so it's very broad on the bottom, but it's very narrow at the top. Turn that upside down, and that's what ministry is. Okay? The one who's at the top, quote unquote, is the servant of all. Jesus said this to his disciples who argued about something in particular throughout his ministry. What was that? Who's the greatest? The night before Jesus is going to be on the cross. He's, he's hours, maybe, maybe minutes away from being uh, ultimately making his way to the, the, the Mount of Olives where he will be arrested. And they are arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom. Okay? Now, we also find out that in that moment, Jesus, rather than give them a lesson on what greatest the kingdom is, he's already told them a number of times. Instead, he gets up, he takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, gets a basin of water, begins to wash these guys' feet. Okay, we're done talking right now. Now I'm going to show you. And he washes their feet. Of course, we're familiar with what Peter says. You can't wash my feet. This isn't right. Bingo, it's not right. It's, it's, in, in a human sense, it's wrong. You're the Lord. You shouldn't be washing my feet. I should be washing yours. But Jesus then answers, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me. But at the end of the lesson, he says, if you call me master and Lord, and rightly so. And if I, your master, will wash your feet, so too should you do for one another. Okay? This is the pinnacle of, mis of ministry, and it is a mystery to most of us. But ministry is not about being served. It's about serving. That's what the word minister means. It doesn't mean one who is served. It means one who serves others. If you want to be a minister in the body of Christ, that's the mindset we have to adopt. We cannot feel like, you know, okay, I've arrived, so I can put my name on my door, and people can see I've arrived. No, never. God forbid it should ever be that way. That is not the call of a minister. Ministers ought not live in ivory towers. They ought to be on their hands and feet with everybody else. This is how it is. Now, that said, Paul says, if anyone seeks the office of a bishop, he seeks a good thing. And it is a good thing. But understand the context in which Paul said this. You know, those who would step into that kind of ministry in Paul's day were asking for trouble. Okay, They were standing up as one who were teaching people to follow after Jesus, who in the mind of the world around them was a cult leader at best. He was he stood in, in defiance to the system of government, to the system of religion. In every way, if you took on the role of a pastor and a teacher, you were asking for trouble. Set aside anything within the church that would have to be dealt with. You don't have to read very far into 1 Corinthians to see that as, as Paul is one who administered these folks as a pastor figure, he had all kinds of mess to clean up in that church. So a pastor is not a lofty goal to be sought after, you should only seek this role if God has called you, okay? And that's true of any ministry. The ministry you should seek the Lord after is the one he has for you. 
But if you are called to be a pastor, then you do seek after a good work. You are setting yourself up to take on a good work, even though you have to understand that, again, if we're going to understand this in the context it was given, then we need to know that there's spiritual warfare involved. There's hardship. There's persecution. And there's also the potential pressures that attend the responsibilities of feeding and leading those whom God has called you to shepherd. It's not necessarily going to be an easy road. The apostles themselves were arrested by the leadership of that time, the Jewish leadership, thrown in jail. And, uh, and, and ultimately, when they were, they, were, they were rebuked, and in some cases, they were beaten and such and sent back out on the street, it says here in Acts chapter 5 to speak of those who endured such things, that they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. They weren't held up in high regard. They weren't given uh, fancy cars and given nice offices and all this kind of stuff. No. If they were going to sign up to do this ministry, it was going to carry with it a load of trouble, and they needed to be mindful of that kind of thing. And that's why I say one should seek after that call which God has placed upon his life and not something else. The work of a pastor is a good work, but it speaks of it being an honorable work. And it's the work that is honorable. God, Paul's going to talk about the, the, the kind of person that ought to take on that work, but recognize it's an honor and a privilege to serve in the role that God is, call, is talking about here through Paul. Okay, so this is, and, 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 and not just anyone is supposed to be in that role. Not everyone is called to that role. But if you are, this is what you need to live up to. Now, of course, I tremble as I, as I read these things and explain them to you. I pray that you never get to know me well enough to know how poorly I stack up to this list. No, of course, it's my desire to live up to these things. And at the outset, yes, it's true. Nobody will ever do all of these things all the time perfectly without fail. We are human. We will have our failings. Chances are at some point, if we know each other for the next 20 years and the Lord tarries, I will let you down at some point. So let me apologize in advance for that. But this is the standard. This is the bar that God is setting that anyone called into pastoral ministry ought to seek to live up to. And if they cannot live up to it, then their calling is not to be a pastor. Okay, again, we're not talking about a failing of a moment. We're talking about living to a lifestyle here that is exemplified in this list or is illustrated in this list. First off, it says here, Again, verse 2, a bishop must then be blameless. And the word blameless means one who cannot be laid hold of, one with whom no accusation can be brought. A man must live a life of a pattern of integrity. Again, we all have our moments of failure, but the rule of, 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 of life for us ought to be one of integrity. It ought not be one where we're constantly falling in and out of walking with the Lord and not. There ought not be a constant pattern of backslides and this kind of thing. Can a pastor fall and be restored? I think he can. But we ought not think that the norm for somebody who's going to lead others in ministry from a pastoral standpoint should be prone to failings. We need to reconsider whether or not such a one is called to ministry. But blameless, one could not, who cannot be laid a hold of or finger pointed at as having the kind of life where accusations can be brought against him. Secondly, he goes on then to say, must be the husband of one wife. Okay, this speaks of integrity in marriage. Now we think, well, of course, husband of one wife. We would, God would never condone a pastor having multiple wives and this kind of thing. But it speaks of integrity in marriage. Now he's speaking about those in the role of pastor. Now he speaks about integrity in marriage. He's talking about one who is not married, divorced, married, divorced. Remember the culture in which he wrote there was divorce was rampant. For a Christian minister, you ought to be married once. You ought to be faithful to your wife. You ought to stick with this person, and you ought to walk with them with integrity. You ought to have, as Paul will say later, there ought to be an order in your home where a godly lifestyle is possible amongst you as a couple. Now, this I don't believe this extends back to the time before you're a Christian. Your BC days are just that. That is the past. It's buried. It's dead. It's gone. If you're divorced in your life before you're a Christian, God may still call you to be a pastor, but if you are a believer who is married and then divorced, uh, this may sound awfully strict, but it's entirely possible that Paul is talking about once you are divorced, you ought not remarry. Okay? And again, he's setting a tone here for, for a, he's setting a bar kind of high. And I don't think we ought to lower it just to make ourselves comfortable. I think this is what he is saying. Now, again, it's, while this does not uh, speak to those, again, uh, who, are, who are maybe divorced in their lives prior to coming to Christ, and is there grace for maybe someone who's gotten back into ministry after being divorced and remarried? Yes, there is. Again, we're talking about a standard and a bar that God is setting. And we ought to be aware of these things and know them before we take on a ministry like this. Um, I like to, I've never done it, but a friend of mine at work introduces his wife as his first wife. Let that one get around your head for a minute. <laughs> I'd like you to meet my first wife. 
you know. But uh, anyway, so we'll think on that one for a minute. It goes on then to say temperate. Temperate, okay? This idea of temperate means to be able to keep your head in any situation, okay? Now this is, this is a tougher one because, you know, there's things come at us from any direction and suddenly you might hear something and, and you're, you know, somebody does something, you're all disappointed in them kind of a thing and you start getting a mental rant or even an outward rant on this kind of thing. That's not temperate. Temperate means that when something is thrown at you, you have the kind of personality where you've submit, or you've at least come to the place of submitting to the Holy Spirit, where He has worked on this to you in you, where you are temperate. You're not going to fly off the handle when something comes your way. You're able to have self-control in your way of thinking and approaching circumstances when they come. He goes on to say, sober-minded. Now that means to take seriously the pastoral work in which you've been called. Remember, the context is those who are called into ministry. Now everybody ought to be sober-minded, don't get me wrong. And by the way, don't mistake sober for somber. Okay, two different words. Uh, there are those that, that believe that the Christian life is so serious and so hard to walk that there's just no such thing. I, I'll say I've got the joy of the Lord, but you know, you can tell it's, they don't. Because it's just, it's hard, it's difficult, it's oppressive feeling. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life, we're intended to be sober, but it doesn't imply somber. Sober means we take something seriously. We don't allow ourselves to sort of be uh, uh, overwhelmed by, or taken aside by other things. We, we recognize, no, I need to think about this. I need to recognize the weight of what I'm doing here and approach it appropriately. To take seriously, and again, in this context, to take seriously the pastoral work to which you've been called. He goes on then to speak of uh, one who is of good behavior. That literally means orderly. Okay, it doesn't mean he's uh, just you know he plays nice with others. That's not really the implication here, although they should. But uh, the implication here is orderly. Orderly. Okay, uh, he leads an organized kind of a life so that he's not easily thrown off kilter. Okay, it, con it connects with the idea of being tempered a little bit in the sense that if you are if you if you don't have if your life is constantly chaos, then when something else gets thrown at you, it just throws you even more so. And so the call is to have an organized approach to life. Okay, one who is able to get through things without constantly being pulled in every direction, being scatterbrained and this kind of thing. Uh, it's not that one should not be able to be flexible as the Holy Spirit leads, but when the Holy Spirit does lead outside of his structure, he won't be thrown into disarray. This kind of man has a workable pattern to his life, allowing time for the priorities of his ministry. Okay? Now, I've gone full-time. I'm about a month now into this thing, and, and I'm generally an organized person by nature. Okay? And I've had to learn to... I've gone from having to fit things into my life outside of the workplace to now fitting things into my life in a way that allows me to serve you guys in, in a more, fil hopefully, fulfilling way. And that means I, 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 I have to set time for, for preparation and study. I have to set time for prayer. I have to make sure that I have time where I'm available to people when they need me. I have to make time for things, whatever. Things can get out of hand very quickly if you don't have some kind of order to your life. It doesn't mean you have to just get everything meted out into every minute of the day because we can then become a slave to our day planners. And when God does call us outside of that, we're thrown all into a prison. That's not what it means. But be orderly, be, uh, be intentional, be purposeful. Don't let your life be chaotic is what he's saying here. One who is of good behavior, but it really speaks of being orderly. The opposite of a disorganized kind of a life. Uh, he continues now. He says hospitable. Hospitable. That word literally means loving the stranger. It means being given to hospitality. And in that culture, that would have been a very simple thing to understand. Because you would have people traveling from town to town. People who might be strangers in town. Well, a pastor would take uh, someone who's called to pastoral ministry. And really, this is something that's open to any believer. But no less so for the pastor. Be willing to take someone in. Give them food. Give them a place to stay. Provide for them in a way while they're here. Okay, it speaks to being able to just demonstrate practical, tangible love to someone who may, you may not even know, okay, in a given circumstance. So hospitable. You're given to hospitality, that kind of a mindset. goes on then to continue by saying, able to teach. Okay? Now, this is central to the life of a pastor. Okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, in the book of Acts chapter 6, the apostles were so overwhelmed by all the practical needs of the people in the, in the constantly heavily growing church that it became difficult for them to focus on what their primary ministry was and that was prayer and the ministry of the word okay the primary role that i have in this church is to teach that is my primary role is to feed you from god's word 
Okay, that is my primary calling. Alongside of it is to pray. As a matter of fact, two of my favorite verses uh, speak to this very issue. One is in Ezra 7.10, where it talks about Ezra, how he prepared his heart uh, to know the Word of God, to do the Word of God, and to teach the Word of God. I was just teaching Nina this idea. Okay, it's not enough to just know it, you need to do it. It's not enough to just do it, but if you're called to teach it, teach it, but don't teach it unless you're knowing it and doing it. That would be hypocrisy. So we need to prepare our hearts to know the Word of God and to do it and to teach its statutes. And in, in his case, it was in Israel. Uh, in our case, it's here in our fellowship. The other passage comes out of uh, 2 Samuel, where uh, Samuel, or, uh, uh, yeah, 2 Samuel, where Samuel talks about, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Okay? The, for, the importance of, of prayer ministry in the life of a pastor cannot be overstated. And so the, the, the ministry of prayer and the word, even as the apostles said. Now, for a pastor to be a pastor, he must be able to teach. And I don't think this simply means by example, like living a pastoral kind of life. That needs to be there. And Paul talks about these things as we've been discussing. But teaching specifically means disseminating the truth of God, teaching God's word. He must be able to communicate the word of God. That's primary. If you're, if you're not called to teach, you're not called to be a pastor. Now, we will, all, uh, we will all arrive at various levels of ability in that regard, but God will give you the ability to teach, and there will be fruit from that ministry. Okay, There will be those who will grow and learn as you teach them the word of God, so you must be able to teach. Now, on a spiritual level, it is completely something that we trust the Holy Spirit to take of our lack and do something meaningful with it. On a practical level, on a physical practical level, this implies study. Okay? Now, I've heard those in the past. I shouldn't say those and pluralize it, but I've heard of one in particular. When asked how he prepares to teach on a Sunday morning, he said he, at the time, and I, I would never presume he necessarily still feels this way, but at the time his answer was, well, I just crack open a Coke and go for it. Are you kidding me? Now, I've heard people that sound like they're just cracking open a Coke and going for it, but all that really means is they've not taken the time to study. Okay? This is God's Word. This isn't some book club. Who cares what Oprah means if you're going to read one of her book recommendations? Whatever. This is God's Word. You don't just show up on Sunday and decide, okay, I where were we last week? Over oh, here, through chapter 3. Okay, this is what I think this means. No. No, 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 no. This is God's Word. It means you prepare. It means you study. It means you avail yourself resources and commentaries and, and concordances and things. Get into the Word. Know what it means. Put it in its context so you don't just extrapolate whatever you think it might mean for today. Understand how passages go together, how they connect throughout Scripture. This is all God's Word, not just part of it, all of it. So it all works together as an integrated whole. Learn how that is. Find out what that means and then teach it. Don't ever, really, if you, if you really knew what this was, would you ever imagine standing in front of people and just winging it with God's Word? Imagine if Moses came down from Mount Sinai and, oh, forgot the tablets up at the top of the hill. Let me just tell you what I think God meant. Are you kidding? No. No, no, no. And we're laughing, but some people do not take seriously their calling. You know, it's Saturday night before they even open the Bible. Now, I'm not speaking about those that work 80 hours a week and they still have a calling. Two years ago, I was at a pastor's conference uh, where uh, one, of the, one of the side sessions was um, was uh, tent-making pastors, people who work outside of the church, and again, as I did up until a month ago. And I, you'd listen to the stories of these guys, and they'd be working, again, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, fitting in time in the Word whenever they could because they knew they had a calling, and God was blessing their ministry, but they didn't have hours to pour in on a Saturday or during the course of the week. I can't tell you what a privilege it is for me to be able to serve you full-time. Thank you. Because when I think about even just my life and what, what was involved in preparing, uh, it, my heart breaks for guys that have even less than that. But they do it because they're trying to be faithful. I'm not speaking to that person. That person is doing the very best with the time they have. But for those that have time to prepare and just feel like teaching is just sort of another thing that they do in their ministry, shame on you. This is God's word. You don't ever ever take lightly when you're teaching the Word of God, okay? You must be able to teach, and if you're going to be able to teach, then you must prepare. 
Paul told Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing or cutting straight the word of God. And remember what, what James says about teachers. Don't let many of you seek the idea of being a teacher. Why? Because you will be held to a stricter judgment. Okay? Every word we say from the pulpit is going to, we're going to be held accounted for. There's a stricter judgment with this. You must be able to teach. And you must not fear that responsibility if you're called to do it. But you also must not take it lightly. It's the central ministry that you have as a pastor. Now, it goes on to say, not given to wine. Not given to wine. Literally meaning not be misbehaving over wine. Okay? Not one who's getting all tipsy with wine and starts to lose control of his faculties. You'll remember how Paul says, don't be drunk with wine wherein is dissipation, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? I'm going to say something that will make some of you bristle. Some of you will cheer and say, thank God he said this. But the Bible does not say that you cannot drink. Okay? There is no mandate saying you cannot drink. Okay? I don't drink. Okay? I do not drink at all. And I have not in 20 years. Okay? And there are reasons why I, I, you know, I believe God delivered me from alcohol. But even though I have a right to have a drink if I want to, biblically speaking, I don't. Years ago, I was at a restaurant with, uh, with a friend. I was not a believer at the time, but there was a priest sitting at another table. I'm not, I'm not putting this on all priests at all, but there was a priest sitting at a table of a nearby parish in my neighborhood, and he was totally carrying on with some other people from the church and, and, and all this kind of thing, and, and, and I, I noticed him having a few beers along the way. Now, I was not a believer, but something about that just didn't seem right to me, okay? And when I became a pastor, God put that into my heart, and I'd already, God already brought me out of drinking. I wasn't a pastor on the day I got saved, but after I finally became a pastor and started serving in ministry that way, I especially just laid out there, I'm not going to drink because people will see me drinking and they may get the wrong idea. Does that mean you can't have a beer or a glass of wine? I'm not going to tell you the answer to that. The Bible does not prohibit you from having a drink. Whether or not you should have a drink or not is something that you need to come to the Lord with. But for a pastor, he is not to be given to wine. Okay, he's not to linger over the wine. He's not to, uh, to, to need it. You know, it's one thing to have a drink. It's another thing for a drink to have you. Okay? A pastor ought never to be given to wine, much less misbehave over it. Now, he goes on there to say, and not violent. Not violent. Okay? Not combative or contentious. He's not looking for a fight. Uh, a pastor ought to be well-mannered, okay, in this regard. We ought to not compromise our convictions, but we ought not be looking for fights, okay? Uh, a lot of times when we, uh, when we stand in a place like this and we teach on different subjects, we're taken to task on many things, some of them theological, some of them cultural or societal. Uh, it matters how we approach these things as pastors. We ought not be just looking for some chance to jump up on a soapbox and start pointing fingers at stuff. That ought not be the heart of a pastor. There are times when it will be necessary to do that, and we should not shy away from them, but we ought not be looking forward to a fight. Okay, I, I think there's something wrong with someone who has that kind of mindset to begin with. But Paul here even says, look, you're not to be combative or contentious, and you're not to be looking for a fight. Not greedy for money. Uh, it's just simply a way of saying that a pastor ought to be pure-hearted in regard to finance. Okay, a pastor should be pure-hearted in regard to finance. Um, uh, our church is a healthy church financially, and I know the condition of the flock in that regard. I know what's in the bank and that kind of thing. But I don't know what any of you give. I have no idea. You know, if one day you leave a service and I've stepped on your toes, you think, boy, if you only knew what I gave, you'd have never said that. That's why I don't know. That's why I don't know. Okay? I don't think it's right for you. Now, that's not a, a biblical mandate. There's no rule that says I can't know those things. But I choose not to know that. That is a self-imposed rule that I have, and that I've always had, that my pastor always had, and most of the Calvary guys that I know have that mindset. They don't want to know what's in the offering box, who it came from, and how much it was on the check. Because you don't want, human nature is such, where you will begin to worry. If all of a sudden people start leaving the church, you don't want to start ticking off the big givers, you know? Well, no, that's, that's impurity of heart. That's a wrong kind of mindset to have. And so I remove myself from the knowledge of that. I don't count the box on Sundays. We have two of our other elders do that, and always two. Okay, there's accountability. Um, when it comes to my salary, I had nothing to do with the discussion about what my salary would be. I did not tell them what I needed. I did not tell them what I should get paid. I didn't, 
they ask me a few questions and they establish my salary. And they will decide my salary going forward. That is not my choice. Okay? I think that if you're going to walk an interior in that way, that becomes something that you do to maintain that. So you're not greedy for money. The Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. What does it say? The love of money is the root of all evil. So we ought to guard our hearts, especially as pastors when it comes to that. Now, it goes on to say gentle. It speaks of being patient. Okay? Uh, must be able to listen to people, even in the face of criticism. You ought not be defensive when someone has something to say to you. You're patient. You listen when people have things going on in their lives and you're, and you're, you're, you're interested, you're involved. But even when it comes to them having something to say against you, you want to be the kind of person that can be patient with that and not feel like you can't learn something from it. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, my pastor, uh, Phil Walmart, back in Chicago, you know, he had, he had given some great advice early on. He said, you know, there have been times in, in my ministry, he said, when people have just come at me with the most ridiculous kinds of claims and problems and such, or saying that I have a problem with this, that, whatever kind of thing, and they may have gotten it totally wrong. But rather than get up in their face and try and defend myself, I'll just simply graciously accept it and just ask the Lord if there's something within what they said that I was supposed to hear. Is there something there you really are trying to tell me? And I think that's a good mindset. And I think that's really what's in play here when Paul says gentle in, uh, in regard to being patient in that. He says not quarrelsome. It's uh, very much similar to the same idea here of not being violent, but it speaks also really of being a peacemaker. Okay, not only are you not looking for a fight, but you're also trying to bring peace in a situation. Okay? I think there's, uh, there are some, th again, when it comes to doctrine, we don't compromise, but in interpersonal relationships, a lot of times there's peace to be found in compromise. And I think you need to have a mindset there where you're not quarrelsome, you're not see seeking to add fuel to the fire, but rather you're trying to bring peace. Now, continuing, he says, uh, not, covetous, uh, not covetous. Now, this certainly would speak to money, but that's not the only thing we can be covetous about, okay? Uh, matter of fact, a favorite thing to be covetous about, if I can put it that way among pastors, is how big's your church? Uh, you know, it doesn't take long in almost any circle of pastors where somebody doesn't ask the question, you know, how big's your church? How many you got coming now? How's it going? Uh, I'm fond of responding by saying, well, look, you know, Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible. It's not necessarily your barometer for success. Uh, it's not. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we're a growing church. That's wonderful. But if God never grew us beyond this number or even shrunk us down to a certain number, that's his deal. That's his whole thing. So we ought not covet that. And that could apply to anything. That's just one particular area. But we ought not be covetous. We ought to rather learn to be content. Even again, as Paul had said in Philippians, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, to both abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now we say that verse a lot, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And yes, there's a principle under that. But remember the context in which Paul said it. In any circumstance I find myself, I can be I can, be, uh, I can be completely uh, fine where I am. I can be content. Why? Because Jesus has given me the strength to do it. Okay? We find our reliance upon him, not on the thing that we are consumed with in some worldly sense. We ought not be covetous. Okay? Now, he says, uh, he goes on then to speak about ruling in his own house. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house... How will he take care of the church of God? Um, that's a very sensible kind of statement. Um, what place does a man have standing in a pulpit if his own house is in total disarray? How can he bring order and peace in the house of God if his home life is in chaos? Okay, that's just a very plain sense kind of a thing. Uh, he ought to be able to rule his own house well. He ought to be able to just, you know, when it says his children in submission, it doesn't mean he's beaten them into submission. It means that he's created a godly household in which the children can be kids, but they also recognize their place in, in terms of their parents being the ones who are really in charge of the house. Uh, you know, in our day in society, that's not always true, is it? Some kids rule the house. You know, if, if you dare to step on their toes or you're getting in front of the TV when they're watching something, they rule that with that rod of iron and, and command you out of their sight. That's not, that's not a godly household, okay? And a pastor ought to be able to have order in his household uh, and such that, uh, that, that he might then effectively be able to, to, to lead in the house of God. It's hypocritical for it to be otherwise. Um, he goes on then to say, not a novice, not a new believer. That's what that means. Not one who has just come to the faith. Okay, now notice what he says here. Obviously, we're not going to get into deacons today. Uh, we'll have to do that next time. I realize it's getting a little late. But he says, not a novice. 
lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Okay? Not a novice. A new believer ought not be put into a place of leadership in the church, much less as a pastor. Uh, a new believer may even recognize a calling on their lives, but they must be tempered by Christian experience before they lead. Okay? Why? Because if not, pride can insidiously find its way into that person's life and not only destroy their life, but destroy those they are seeking and thinking that they're ministering to. Uh, years ago, I'll again point to an example in my own life, but um, not long after I came to Christ, I remember talking to Pastor Phil and saying, I, I, just for some reason, I felt like God may be calling me to teach. And, uh, and, and you know, I, just, I was just sharing with him. I, I didn't know what that meant or what that would open up to, but, but I'm just sharing with you as my pastor. And he very wisely did not say, well, why don't you go start a Bible study and let's see what happens. He said, why don't you plug in a ministry somewhere in the church? Why don't you start helping out a little bit? Just find a ministry and plug in. Set up chairs, do sound, do whatever. You know, just get involved somewhere and see what God does with that. And let's see where he leads you. Well, so I did that. I got, I started showing up, setting up chairs. I helped in the sound ministry. I was duplicating tapes. How many of you remember tapes? <laughs> yeah. well, we used to have tape duplicators. And it was a pretty big deal if you had a, one that could duplicate three at a time. Now you're flying, you know? And so uh, then we moved to CDs and all that kind of thing. But um, so, so I did that for a, for a long time and all that. And then one day, eventually, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think I was in the worship ministry by that point. But eventually, uh, you know, uh, a Bible, we started a Bible study. And God blessed a little bit. We had a few people coming out, and, and I made all kinds of stupid mistakes. I learned the value of study, which in some cases I learned the hard way because I, you know, I thought I knew something, and then I'd get taken a task on it and all this kind of thing. So you, you, you learn to sort of cut your teeth in ministry by just helping, serving anywhere, okay? And then you grow, and then God eventually calls you. And if you're called to be a pastor, it's probably not going to simply be because you went to school or because you, uh, because you just feel called to be a pastor, Okay, there's much more to it than that. You know, you need to make sure that as a new believer, you take time to let God teach you what he wants to teach you, that you might grow into a place where he can really use you, and you won't fall to the kind of pride that ultimately caused the devil to be judged. Okay? God does not want you to walk in the same kind of a place, making those kinds of mistakes based solely on pride. And then verse 16, and this is where we'll, uh, sorry, not verse 16, uh, verse 7 here, we'll, uh, number 16 as far as these qualifications go. And we'll stop here today. I realize we're going to go too long if we continue. Um, but he says here in verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. A good testimony among those who are outside. You must have a good reputation outside of the church. Okay? In your workplace, in your home, in your neighborhood, you need to have a good testimony. If you're the kind of person that people point to and say, this guy is always, you know, he's, he's, che he's cheating on his time card at work, or he's, you know, it seems like, where's all the pens and notepads disappearing to? Or, you know, how come this guy always shows up later? He never does a good job, or he's always the last guy on the team to, to, to pull his weight or this kind of thing. He never wants to work overtime. Uh, or what about in the neighborhood? It's like, you know, how come, uh, you know, it seems like, you know, whenever we do something as a neighborhood, they never want to be around, or you know, whatever kind of thing. It's like people, you know, you need to have a good reputation outside the church. Now, now, granted, Jesus did say, be careful when the world starts speaking well of you, right? So how does this flesh out? How does this balance? When Jesus was warning about the world speaking well of you, it implied that you were walking too close to the world where they're like, they, they dig you. You're, you're my kind of Christian. I never feel guilty around you. Uh, you're never preachy or anything like that. We like that kind of Christian. Well, God doesn't like that kind of Christian. God wants you to change if that's what you're like. But that's not what you're, So Jesus was saying, be careful you're walking too close to the line. Again, we're talking about being so relevant to the world that you're irrelevant to the plans and purposes of God. Uh, but what, what, where the line is really put out here, Paul is not saying compromise your convictions. Rather, be quite the opposite. Allow your convictions to fuel the kind of person you are in the workplace, in the neighborhood, among uh, social gatherings, wherever you happen to be. You are someone that people can always count on. You're somebody who will always walk in integrity. I may not like what you're doing when you're talking to me about Jesus, but I'll tell you what, I always know you're telling the truth. I may not like the whole, this whole church thing that you're part of. I may have liked you before you were an unbeliever, but I will say this. Your life is, is, is in a lot of ways, something I would like to live like. I'd like to experience the kind of peace that you have because of the life that you live. Do you want people who are outside of the church to recognize that you are fundamentally different than they are for good reasons? 
you know, Peter says it's one thing if you're persecuted as a Christian for the right reasons, but it's a bad idea when you're persecuted just for being obnoxious. It ought not be that way. But people ought to be able to look at the integrity and quality and character of a believer and say, well, I'm willing to listen because I can see what kind of person you are and the fact that you, you're, you're straight and narrow and that kind of thing. It's a blessing. That's the kind of testimony a pastor should have. Uh, and that's why I said when I was leaving my job, I wanted to finish well. You know, it's like you try and have a testimony where you are for a number of years so that when you leave, people will remember you in a good light, that, that God may not be dishonored. That's the mindset behind that. So we always want to do our very best where we are that God might be glorified. And this is certainly going to be true when it comes to pastors in the church. Now, next time, he's going to speak about qualifications for deacons and such. And some of these are the same. Some of them are a little different. He actually speaks to the deacons' wives uh, in this as well. And then he, he finishes with, uh, uh, with another section we'll talk about as well. And the reasons that he speaks about these things, uh, are, are they serve two purposes. And we'll reiterate this next week. One is because he wants to make sure that while he is away, before he finally comes to Timothy, that Timothy will know how we ought to conduct ourselves in the house of God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. Okay, so within the context of the church, it's important to know how we function. Leadership is important, but the right leadership is important. Secondly, because chapter 4 talks about the coming apostasy. And a church needs to be soundly grounded and solid in regard to truth and practice, so when the apostasy starts to take root, and I would suggest to you that it already has, that the body of Christ stands as a beacon in that kind of a culture. Okay, So Paul is laying this out, uh, that they might know these, be prepared in these two ways. So we'll speak about deacons and finish up chapter 3 next week. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll also, uh, um, as we close our Bibles today, uh, take some time to share in the Lord's Supper together. But before we do, I'd like to close our teaching time and prayer. Now, we spoke today a lot about what leadership in the church is like, what it means to be part of the body of Christ, what it means to be a pastor in the body of Christ. Um, and that being said, I always like to make sure that at the end of a service, that we present an opportunity for anyone who does not know the Lord to come to faith even right now. Now, we've not spoken with a whole lot of evangelism in mind. This has been a little bit of a technical thing in some regards, but nonetheless, we're in a place here gathered together because we want to learn what it means to walk with Jesus. We want to be in a place where Jesus is elevated and magnified. And with that in mind, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that even in a teaching like this, Jesus is at the core. He has the motivation as to why pastors want to live this way, why we want to serve this way, why you mean so much to us as, as, as those we're called to minister to. He is the reason for all of this. And the reason we look to him as our example is because he set the ultimate example of service and sacrifice. He set the tone for what ministry looks like. And so we're going to honor him right now by remembering, even as he called us to, when he gathered around with his 12 disciples, his guys, his, the ones who he loved, the ones who said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. You, you're, you're the ones who are going to turn this world upside down, ultimately. We need to have this moment together. We can say all that, obviously. But the point was he's investing in these, in, in these, these guys, these apostles, that they might be ready for what's about to come. Their whole world was about to be rocked as Jesus was arrested, ultimately scourged in the worst possible kind of conditions, and then nailed to a tree, nailed to a cross. Why would he do that? Why would he endure such things? The disciples themselves would flee when he was arrested. So much of the world throughout history from that time would never believe in him. Why would he do that for a world that is in rebellion against him? Because he loves us. Because his love is perfect and enduring and deep and expressive. He goes to the cross and he pays for our sins that we might know just how far his love goes. And so that's worth remembering. And so I'm going to close in prayer and as we move into this time of communion, I want to give anyone in this room or even within the sound of my voice or who's watching this to understand that now is a moment for you to come to Jesus. There's no reason to put it off anymore. There's no value in waiting till tomorrow to come to Christ and to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to give you a fresh start, to make you a new creation where old things pass away and all things become new. There's nothing worth holding on to and keeping you from making that choice today. And so with that in mind, let me close in prayer. And after we close in prayer, I'll have the ushers come up and grab the communion elements and pass them out to everybody. But Father, we want to come before you in this moment, in the quietness of this moment right now. We thank you, Lord your grace. We thank you that, Father, though you are a God who is just and righteous 
and holy and unapproachable, dwelling in a light that no man can approach. You're the God who thundered from Sinai and told uh, Moses to make sure the other people didn't touch the mountain. You're holy, and frightfully so. The Father, the peace that you have allowed us to experience in knowing you personally, the grace that you have poured out above measure on us, the reconciliation that you bring is all because of Jesus. God in the flesh who came into this world to save sinners. We thank you, Lord, that though you are holy and just and righteous, you are also a God who loves and who is gracious and who is kind and who is long-suffering and who recognized the dilemma that we are in and sent your son that that debt might be paid, that that problem might be solved, that the narrow road that leads to destruction, the Lord, you take our feet off of that and set them instead on the narrow road that leads to everlasting life. That is all your work, and we praise you for this. If there's any in this room who have never asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins, have never given their hearts to him, surrendered their lives to him, asked him to be their savior and their Lord, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Young or old, there is never a time too early in your life to come to Jesus and ask him to forgive you and to help him to ask him to help you walk with him the rest of your days. And there is no shame in being older and making that commitment today. Jesus came for you. As a matter of fact, if you were the only one that ever needed him, he would have died on that cross for your sins. That is the love of God so great and so deep. So Father, I pray that you'd speak to the hearts of those right now that are ready to give their lives to you and surrender their hearts as well. And to you, if that's you, I would just ask you to repeat after me this very simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I realize that I am a sinner. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against others. I have broken your law. I haven't given you the time of day, but I have been the Lord of my life. I'm so sorry for these things. And I ask you to forgive me, to make me clean, and to make me new. I believe that Jesus died for all of my sins. Every last one. And I believe that he alone can save me. I believe in him, and I want to follow him all the days of my life. Give me the strength to walk with Jesus. I thank you for forgiving me, and I thank you for loving me and being kind and gracious to me. Take me by the hand until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, there's nothing complicated or complex about it. It's your opportunity to simply come before the Lord and ask Him to forgive you. And if you did it, then I want to welcome you to the family of God. That means everything. It doesn't just mean something. It means everything. Praise the Lord. And now I just welcome you as the rest of us come together and join in this time of the Lord's Supper. I'd ask the ushers, uh, if you're able to come on up and grab the communion uh, plates and distribute them. I'll have the worship team come on up and share with us as we uh, partake. Uh, if you would, just... Take the bread and the cup and hold on to it until after the song, and then we'll share it together.
Dancing through the storm And walking on the water Even when I could not see In the middle of it all When I thought you were a thousand miles away Not for a moment Did you forsake me? illustrations. He takes the bread and he shares it with them. He takes the cup and he shares it with them. Familiar elements in what would have been a familiar time together, but now infused with a, a much deeper understanding of what deliverance would really look like. No longer was Jesus speaking or there to be thinking 
in terms of being delivered from oppression in a physical sense, a far greater enemy was going to be vanquished here. So he took the bread. He said, this bread is my body. It is broken for you. For as often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. Father, we want to take this bread now and remember Jesus who is willing to go and allow himself to be broken for our stead. Let's take the bread together. And it also tells us how he took the cup. He said, this is a cup of my blood and shed for the remission of the sins of many. It's the blood of a new covenant. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And Father, we want to thank you that Jesus was willing to shed his blood to blot out our transgressions, to cover all of our sins and the tremendous debt that we owed. It's his finished work that allows us to be here celebrating both this moment and the eternity that awaits us. It's all his work. And we bless him and praise him for it. Let's take the cup together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for your grace and mercy. We thank you that heaven's peace and perfect justice have kissed this guilty world in love at the cross. We thank you, Father, that you are so willing to give so much for so many with so little. But that's who you are, and we worship you. And we thank you, and we praise you. Pray that, God, you would help us to live different kinds of lives as we seek to be more like Jesus. We are redeemed. We are forgiven. We're covered by your grace, and we're filled with your Holy Spirit. Guide our steps as we leave this place, and be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you all stand? Do you close this up? All right. Praise the Lord. to you. Uh, if any of you prayed to receive Christ today, I invite you to stay as well. It might give you a Bible and help answer some questions and get you off on the right foot here as you begin walking with him. Uh, it's a blessing to walk with Jesus and I'll help you do that. So, But uh, in, in any case, have a great week. God bless you. Uh, this coming Thursday, by the way, we will not have midweek because it's our first Thursday of the month. And so uh, if you'd like to help out in the, uh, the ministry of Second Harvest, you can see uh, Joel and Shannon are in the back. You can uh, meet with them as well and I'll be glad to help you get plugged into that. Uh, but God bless you. Go before you this week. Amen. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. Nothing to say it. <laughs>